Hello, this is Carl Ackerman with the host of History is Here to Help with Scott Kikawa, who has written such a wonderful, uh, well, he's written several books, but I just finished Kona Wins, and this is the topic of today. And um, we're going to focus primarily, but not exclusively, on the time period that um, uh, Mr. Kikawa has uh, chosen to write about, because it is a wonderful time period, and he does a uh, a really splendid job um, um, of the history. So let me begin by just asking you to describe yourself, because I, you have sort of a law enforcement background, which is not the usual uh, writer background, uh, especially for Bamboo Ridge, I may add. <laughs> Yep, yeah, that, that's right. Um, I work for the federal government. I work for the Department of Homeland Security for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. I supervise an intelligence unit uh, out at the airport, and I'm a task force officer for another three-letter acronym federal agency, um, who I'm not going to name because I didn't run this by their press office, but they're located out in Kapolei. That's pretty clear. And, you know, the big question is, you know, um, what, what got you into writing? Um, you know, why, why did you become an author and um, something that you're um, really quite good at and, you know, um, a author of a particular time period? Well, well thanks for saying that, Carl. Uh, if this was really the result of a drunken dare. Uh, this was about 12 <laughs> years ago. I was sitting in a bar in Kaimuki with a good friend of mine, Dr. Jason Chung, who's a professor at UH West Oahu. He uh, teaches history and Asian pop culture. And I've known Jason for years now, I think since we're both in middle school. And I was complaining to him over drinks about the lack of really good mystery fiction set in Hawaii, because we've got a ton of mysteries that are set here, uh, but they're mostly written by people outside of Hawaii. And it really only uses this place, and I should add the people, as a backdrop for standard cookie-cutter plots that you could put another backdrop behind Paris, New York, wherever, and uh, use the same story, and all you would be doing is changing the set dressing. I, I complained that there wasn't a book, uh, that was set in the period that I want. I, I know that Vicki Newble has written some fantastic, uh, what we call traditional mysteries, uh, more more in the vein of Agatha Christie. And she sets hers, I believe, in the 1930s, uh, Waffle in the 1930s. Uh, they're great books, and, and they follow that, uh, that traditional uh, pattern. What I wanted was uh, to see something in noir, something that was uh, hard-boiled, uh, something along the, the lines of the work that I really love, which is Raymond Chandler, which is Dashiell Hammett. And uh, we didn't have anything like that here. So Jason said, rather than complain about the lack of good uh, crime fiction here, why don't you write something? And this was about 12 years ago. I, I hadn't written anything before then besides reports for work and whatever I wrote in college uh, for a grade. So I, I tried, and uh, and here we are. I know that's kind of uh, fast-forwarding it quite a bit, but that's uh, that's how I got into it. Well, you know, um, on that theme, um, which is a great theme um, about setting it in Hawaii and uh, post-World War II but before statehood, um, I, I want to go right into, I was going to ask you some other questions first, but because you mentioned this, um, you know, your book mentions everything from Lei to Luau, and you mention um, you mention regions like uh, Papakolea. Uh, you discuss uh, institutions like Queens Hospital. Your references to food, um, you know, runs the gamut of Hawaii food, and, and particularly with certain police officers eating things that aren't donuts in the station. And you know, my question to you is, why did you pick this, and how do you expect? Your local reader in Hawaii, and luckily I married uh, my wife, so I understand what Nishibe is. But how is someone, uh, you know, if I were to give this uh, book, which I promised you to my sister, how is she going to know in Berkeley uh, what Nishime is? Or do you just assume that people will look this up, or are you looking for a primary Hawaii audience? Well, you know, it was never my intention to write exclusively for a Hawaii audience, uh, but at, on, uh, you know, at the same time, it was not my intention to 
uh, make it more accessible for readers outside of Hawaii. That was a conscious choice, by the way. Uh, that was both me and my publisher, Bamboo Ridge Press, who decided, you know, we're not going to italicize anything. Or, or actually, we do italicize some terms, but they are the medieval Italian terms, the Latin terms, uh, the French terms uh, that are in the book. We do not italicize Hawaiian words. We don't italicize Japanese words or Cantonese words or Ilocano words uh, because those aren't foreign languages here. Uh, the other languages are. And this was a conscious decision on our part. You'll find uh, uh, an editor's note at the very beginning uh, near the prologue uh, of the book where it explains that we also do not use diacritical marks for the Hawaiian terms uh, in the book because this is not what they did in newspapers of the era. So we wanted to stay true to the era. Um, and I did not want to make it anachronistically correct uh, by, by adding diacritical marks. So that was a conscious choice. I think there's a movement afoot, too, with a lot of writers um, Kuno Diaz is one of the ones I think of with his uh, um, uh, Brief Life of Oscar Wilde, uh, or the Wondrous Brief Life of Oscar Wilde, where he uses a lot of Dominican Spanish, and he doesn't bother to explain the terms, he doesn't bother to italicize them or add a glossary, and he expects the readers to find out by context. And that's kind of like the decision that I made. Uh, there, there's a wonderful crime fiction writer, uh, Henry Chang, who wrote a, a series of detective novels set in New York City, I think in the 1980s uh, or something like that, where he has Chinese-American protagonist. He uses a lot of Cantonese terms, but he italicizes them. And I found it a little annoying that he puts a comma after each of those terms and then puts the kind of the English or common definition right after them. Guaylo, comma, white devil, period. Uh, where... That's where the, the benefit of the reader, I guess, was outside of that culture or, or outside of that uh, community. And while it was probably a, a necessary thing, or maybe his, his editor insisted on it at the time, I, I find it distracting. Uh, so by removing all that, I, 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 I sought not to uh, exclude uh, folks that are outside of Hawaii or folks that might not have a context, uh, but to but to give a more authentic experience to the reader, uh, it, something that's a narrative that uh, the protagonist uh, would naturally um, have uh, or, or present to somebody without explanation, without footnotes, uh, and, and without uh, definition somewhere. So, um, you know, I think, you know, um, um, that your novels, and I'm only read one, and I just so enjoyed it, and we'll we'll come back to that in just Thank a you. minute. Um, but um, uh, you know, I've read the complete. I don't think I've uh, he's written anything that I haven't read. But Tony Hillerman, who you know focuses on New Mexico and the Navajo Nation, and I think I learned a lot about the Navajo Nation. I'm um, from Tony Hillerman, and I happened to be in Phoenix recently, and I was uh, there was a um, a guy who who actually lived on the Navajo Nation and was Navajo himself, and I said. You know, did did he get it right as a howly guy, as a white guy? And 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 the guy said, yeah, he did. And you learned a lot by reading his books. And I, I, I think that you know, for me, it's a lot of these things are having lived in Hawaii and married into a local family are quite um, interesting. But you know, I know them, and 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 because of that, you know, there's a lot of adherence. So, which brings up the other point: your historical knowledge um, has to be great because you mentioned things like the HUAC committee. Uh, you mentioned things like Roosevelt being, you know, an English standard school. Um, you talk about the rivalry between, you know, uh, Punahou Roosevelt McKinley. Um, you know, your chief protagonist is a is a uh, you know a former McKinley football player. And so, how did you? And you even mentioned things that are fairly obscure, at least in the contemporary period. Not for me because I, you know, I'm a student of that history. But of you know, mentioned people like Jack Hall, you know, the the communist leader who was instrumental in in leading the Longshoremen and, and stevedores, as as you say, and and I I will I am you know I, I expected, but I did not see Harry Bridges come up, you know, but um I kind of expected him that you mentioned because you mentioned Jack Hall, but anyway, how do you how do you prepare for this kind of you know really in depth, thorough and um, meticulous 
uh, mentioning of historical names? I mean, do you read all about the era, or is that just something that you grew up with, or what? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, ironically, I didn't really grow up with it, though my parents lived through the era as younger people, um, I think as teenagers. Uh, but they have a teenager's or child's perspective of the period, which is they were untouched in a way by current events, uh, the way children uh, or young people often are. So what they remember, and this was valuable too in my anecdotal research by interviewing my mother and people uh, in her generation, uh, to get a feel for the popular culture back then. And, and that was that was extremely important. But a lot of my research uh, was reading. Uh, a lot, and, and I have a lot of help, uh, maybe not for Konowins, but for Red Dirt, the second book, which really looks at the HUAX uh, um, investigations here. Uh, and this was around the time of John Wayne's uh, um, uh, Big Jim McClain movie, uh, which was set here, uh, where he plays a HUAC investigator. Uh, you know, UH Wastawahu, through my friend Jason, he introduced me to Dr. Bill Pewitt, who runs the CLEAR at UH West Oahu, the Center for Labor Education and Research. And Bill was really generous in opening up CLEAR's collection to me. Uh, I went in there uh, at the UH West Oahu Library. They have a, a, a closed off room. And I got to handle primary source material. So when I say primary source material, I'm talking about things like uh, John Reinecke's legal pad with his handwritten notes on them. Uh, uh, ILWU uh, um, minutes from their meetings. Uh, you know, Jack Hall was present at a lot of those meetings, and um, and really, I, that's like, yeah, that's history in, in documentary form. I feel bad. I didn't take white gloves in there. I should have handled them with a lot more care. But uh, those things were made available to me, and I've been really fortunate that organizations like the Clear, like the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii like the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center uh, in Wailuku, or I'm sorry, Kahului, Kahului and Wailuku, they're kind of on the cusp of the, of the two places, uh, have opened up their doors to me and have allowed me to look at their archives, uh, to peruse their oral history, transcripts, and, and a lot of their material. And uh, it's hours of research, but you know, I love it. Uh, I was a history major in college, uh, and it, it's I know that many writers detest that part of writing where they have to do research. In fact, I know that many higher researchers, uh, the more successful ones to do it for them, uh, I would never do such a thing because uh, that it gives me pleasure to uh, dive right into those sources. So that that's what it was. And, and I've amassed my own personal library of Hawaii territorial history because I, I, re I, re I reference those works all the time. Well, you know, your protagonist is, you know, the nickname is Sheik, and he goes into some reference rooms, and, um, and you know, I was wondering if that was based on your own research, because, you know, he's going in there, and he's, he's sweating, and it's dry, and it's, you know, it's, uh, um, and then, you know, he, he goes into, towards the end of, of, of your novel, he go in mystery, he goes into a, one that's, you know, air-conditioned, you know, or at least has some things. And I was wondering, is that based on your own, you know, archival work at things like this? Because it kind of reminds me of my own archival work back in the day. Oh, absolutely. And uh, um, the, yeah, this is personal experience. And really, you know, the, the irony struck me that the experience of moving from climate control to not climate control and back in has not changed all that much over the years. Uh, you know, back then, there was air conditioning by the 1950s, uh, maybe about the 30s, uh, kind of regularly here. But um, research is made up of those, uh, going into those spaces where documents did not necessarily receive the archival treatment. They, they were in warehouse-like spaces, which are hideously hot. And anybody who professionally has to look at those materials has to experience uh, that real, that really uncomfortable uh, climate situation. So yeah, it, and, and I, I've done this in my own job. So it, it's personal experience, but it's also doing the research and, and finding out that things were not much different back then. And, and that it, it's one of those things where if you're an investigator, you're going to spend most of your time doing that kind of research. You know, very, very little of an investigator's job is actually interviewing live people 
a lot of it is what they used to call footwork. Today we do it from a computer at your desk uh, mostly, but back then you had to like drive to the hall of records and uh, um, and bribe, flirt, threaten people in order to get access to those materials and then spend hours with them. And uh, and that's kind of what I wanted to convey. Um, and you do so um, um, really well. Um, and uh, uh, I, I wanted to, and you know, do you also, um, out of your protagonist's mouth, that you say exactly that, that most of detective work is, you know, sort of like the kind of um, what we, people would think of as boring and you, and you don't get the people who are crying at the very end. They're generally just kind of sullen and looking down. And I, I thought those were great, great, um, great references. Um, in addition, you make your main character a Columbia scholar. I mean, you know, he, he this is a guy who's well educated. And um, I, I thought it was also interesting that you use the Divine Comedy. And um, bless you for that, as someone who was trained classically um, in history. Um, you know, I thought to myself, as soon as I saw that, I went, oh, I'm going to like this novel. Uh, but you interject, you know, the uh, the Divine Comedy into different parts of your book. And this is a book, you know, set in Hawaii. And I just thought, how did he come up with this? So I'm going to ask you that. How did you come up with that idea? Well, they, this is a couple of things. This is both research and personal experience. Uh, I, I myself went to school in New York City. Uh, I didn't I didn't go to school at Columbia. Um, I, I got waitlisted there or something, but NYU picked me up. Uh, so I, I, I went to school. Um, several blocks downtown uh, from Columbia, and uh, I was a med medieval and Renaissance studies major at NYU, uh, which happened kind of by accident because uh, my my major was actually Islamic studies, and I figured out that a lot of the odd courses I had taken, I could cobble together a major. It was kind of multidisciplinary, where it was literature and it was history and it was art history and architecture history, all put together. Um, Medieval mysticism is uh, the class that we covered uh, the Divina Commedia in, and uh, one thing that I that struck me about uh, about the Divine Comedy is that it is not a work of devotion like most people think it is if they're not familiar with it. It's satire. Dante wrote the Divine Comedy as a satire, and he lampoons a lot of the political figures of the day. Actually, uh, roasts them outright. Uh, in you know, all throughout the Inferno and, and Purgatorio, like they're they're all like on display uh, with his uh, with his commentary, and I thought, what could be more noir uh, than putting references uh, in into a book uh, on crime fiction, uh, which uh, which references a satire uh, from a different age, but uh, but it's also a commentary that law enforcement and and the laws back then. Uh, we're really kind of medieval in a sense, uh, where we, uh, where where authorities kind of picked and cho uh, and chose what they would enforce and how they would enforce it. Now, we're we're in an age before those key Supreme Court cases like Miranda versus Arizona. That's where the right reading the rights comes from, or Gideon versus Wainwright. Those things happened in the '60s, uh, where it became very progressive and it changed law enforcement. But before that, uh, it was it was pretty much open season. And uh, that, that's one reason I brought it. The other reason I chose to make this particular character a Columbia graduate and, uh, and, and a medieval and Renaissance uh, literature scholar is because it's somewhat historically accurate that a lot of these Nisei soldiers took advantage of the GI Bill and some went to some very prominent universities. Um, it, it was not uncommon to see Ivy League uh, graduates come out of this GI Bill program, and this was one of those things. Uh, he's an individual, uh, this protagonist, so he did not study what his parents would have asked him to study: uh, business administration, for instance, or uh, or something that would have gotten him uh, a better paying job. Uh, he chose to go against the grain, study literature, came home, and found out that one of the only jobs he could get if he didn't want to teach high school uh, was to be a cop. And uh, and this is kind of real life professional uh, um, choices that are that are made uh, not just by people of that era but but some by people of today and uh, and I thought this was this was unusual but it was also historically accurate so that was another reason for choosing that. Well, you know, I mean, this this is an interesting point going back to history because 
if you think about you know how many people um, of different ethnicities went into the Department of Education, it was the only job open for them. Like in the period that you were talking about, the medieval history, you know, Jews um, couldn't go into a lot of professions and couldn't own land. So what were they supposed to do? And they went into finance. Not that all Jews are involved in finance, but it was an open opportunity for them. That that's the only thing they could do to make a living. So that's a that's a, a critically important point. And I, I did not know that many of the people who um, you know, who were like in the 442nd or the 100th Battalion came back and, you know, some of them went to the Ivy League. I do know one uh, uncle-in-law who graduated from Berkeley, which is, I've always considered sort of a public Ivy League, but mm -hmm. there we go. Um, uh, Scott, if you don't mind, there's, um, what I'd like to do now is, and I'm going to have to turn on a light here so that I can read, um, is that um, I want to read a description you gave because what's so wonderful about your book is your writing. And I want to give you. Our, our viewers a sample of that. So, you know, in chapter four, you describe the Honolulu police station. And this is where your history matters comes into play. So this is the paragraph. The Honolulu Police Department station in downtown Honolulu, the Walter Murray Gibson building, stood at the corner of Merchant and Bethel Streets and was done in the Spanish Art Deco style so prevalent in Honolulu buildings erected in the 1920s and early 1930s. The corner entrance with its huge doors was framed in redstone, quarried in y and I, and looked like the entry to some conquistador's manor. The stairs in the foyer were inlaid with hand-glazed ceramic tile, with the receiving desk covered with it. The roof was exposed mahogany, timber from the Philippines, painted with geometric designs, and there was French marble everywhere in the interior. You know, um, you don't get many descriptions like that of in any novel um, these days. And so I wanted to ask you about this. But before you do, there's another one letter. And by the way, I read both of these things to to my wife. If you're a local guy or, you you, you know, you spent many years in Hawaii, which is the case of this historian, um, you're talking about uh, another quote is you're talking about a waitress and you're you're talking about a waitress. Um, in, in a way uh, that goes like this. And it's a one sentence. It's one sentence. And you're describing her. She, you say she was acute in a demure Japanese Makiki church bake sale way. And it's hyphenated. So there are four words involved in that description. You know, how do you do this as a writer? I mean, it's just masterful. So I, I'm going to stop there and let you talk. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. You know, uh, they're just images that come in my head. And uh, a lot of my research is visual. Uh, I love looking at photographs, period photographs. I, I love looking at people's own personal photographs that they'll share them with me from the era. And uh, and these images just, uh, they come up and it would be a shame not to use them uh, descriptively. Uh, the Walter Murray Gibson building is now a city and county, I think it's a part of the tax office these days, but it was the police station at one point. I did enter the building and tour the building on my own. Uh, the folks were uh, that worked there were extremely um, generous and helpful and let me wander uh, about a bit. And I did some research on where the materials came from. But uh, it's a wonderful building, uh, and it's a shame that they had to move from that building. Uh, they moved into the uh, the Sears building on Baratania, in which they stayed there for a few decades until they moved into the present station. But uh, um, but a lot of these images uh, come to me because uh, because I got to look at photographs uh, because I because I got to tour these places. You know, the Al Alexander Baldwin building was also one of those places where. They were also extremely generous and let me like wander around and take photographs. But um, that's uh, that's part of the fun of the research is uh, our field trips. In, in your um, <clears throat> in your research, I was wondering how heavily do you rely on newspapers as a as a as a source? Oh, very much so. The the Honolulu Record, which was the uh, the kind of the counterbalance weekly to the Star uh, Bulletin and Advertiser. Of the time, it was a weekly founded by Koji Ariyoshi. It's really prominent in Red Dirt, my second book. But uh, and this is where uh, Ellen Park, uh, the reporter, works. Uh, I, you know, the Clear, uh, it, Bill Pewitt has told me Clear has all of them digitized, like all the issues digitized. So I got to get in there and look at uh, actual issues of the Honolulu Record from the period, and uh, 
as you can imagine, the most fascinating things about them are not the headlines. Uh, they're the ads, uh, and they're the uh, um, and they're the little side pieces, uh, the sports page, you know, uh, because these things give you a, a, a sense of the era and, and what folks consider to be important. Did you, you know, in your um, in, in looking at um, the newspapers and things like that, were there things that you came across as an author that just that just really shocked you, that surprised you? Um, you know, like, for, uh, for example, you know, most people know about the Massey case, but, you know, things like that that just came up, you said, wow, I didn't know about this. Or, you know, I, 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 I came across a book about an African-American cowboy who, who, uh, who grew up in Hawaii. And that, that just so surprised me. I just didn't know um, that history. Well, many things. Uh, one thing that I saw in the Honolulu Record especially were there were a lot of advertisements in the Honolulu Record, a paper for ostensibly Oahu. Uh, but many, many ads for Japanese-owned florists in Hilo, uh, which really, you, you know, it, it, it gave us a sense that at one point, all the other, the, the neighbor islands were kind of on equal economic and political footing with Oahu. Uh, that would, that, I think that changed forever with uh, World War II uh, and the war effort uh, making Oahu kind of center of everything. But, uh, but it gave me a real sense that... Um, uh, before Oahu became like economically dominant, there was a sense that the uh, that the other islands uh, also uh, were part of that uh, um, of, of the major uh, power structure and schematic. Uh, so that was something that was very surprising for me. Um, you know what I you know when I've uh, come across um, local authors, um, you know they they refer, of course, in the contemporary period, they want me to say use the word continent, um, which I've done. And then they, they 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 don't want me to say outer islands, but neighbor island. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really uh, that was um, uh, really great. So um, tell us about um, your next novel a little bit as a way to, you know, if you're so willing, to sequence into our next talk because you know, uh, and I want to recommend to all our readers, um, Kona Wins, if I can get it straight. In, in there we go. Um, uh, this is and, and you know you're. You, what's nice is also the cover is so apt for what the book is talking about. You know, that's always true. You know, it's like you know, you have your lead detective and his girlfriend in the front bay on the front part, and they kind of look like what you imagine. So that's really good. But but uh, but tell us a little bit about Red Dirt before we go today, Scott. Okay, Red Dirt uh, picks up uh, maybe a couple of weeks after the events of Kona Wins. Same detective protagonist, and a lot of the uh, there are a lot of characters from Kona Wins and Red Dirt, but it's against a backdrop of the House on American Activities Committee's uh, Hawaii investigations, and particularly the the uh, Smith Act trials of the, of the Hawaii Seven. Uh, so this was Jack Hall, uh, Koji Ariyoshi and company, and uh, and brings uh, to the forefront uh, the the Communist Party's activities here uh, and murder uh, together. So that's kind of what it's about. Well, thank you. I'm gonna leave you, you know, we've run out of time here, but I'm gonna leave you with a final word about anything you'd like to say about your writing, um, about the books that you've written, or any kind of advice you'd like to give perhaps to um, to uh, local writers who are thinking about doing it, but maybe don't think that they've got the capacity because of their work schedule, et cetera. And it's important for all to know that you work 24 hours. I mean, 24 hours. You work, you work, uh, you know, a full week. Way. Yeah, a full week, and you're in law enforcement. So that's that's a that's a hefty lift. Well, I, I, I'd like to tell any writer here uh, that if you can tell the story that only you can tell, do it. Uh, I would buy uh, the, bo the book about uh, a Micronesian detective uh, or uh, an Ilocano detective out of Waipahu in a heartbeat because that book hasn't been written yet. Um, to my shock, uh, my books are picked up because nobody had written them yet. Uh, I, I thought that somebody had done this ages ago. Uh, but the territorial period, especially that post-war period and before statehood, that 15-year period we're talking about, roughly speaking, uh, was it, it's part of a neglected history um, here in Hawaii. After the uh, annexation, the overthrow of the monarchy, the annexation, and uh, and today, uh, all those years really get glossed over. There's a mention of Pearl Harbor being attacked, usually because in popular culture, that's the imagination of America. But uh, a lot of this stuff gets swept under the rug, and the people who live through this don't generally talk about it. 
this is why I thought this was rich material. And it's really noir, too, uh, because it has all the trappings of noir. It's a thin veneer of respectability over a lot of bad behavior. And that's the type of stuff that really fascinates me. Uh, but anybody who wants to exploit something uh, in writing, in literature, that hasn't been touched yet, um, and there's a lot here, uh, believe me, uh, please, please do it, uh, because we need those books. And thank you, uh, Scott Kawa. Once again, his book is Kona Wind. So first, he has he described uh, Red Dirt also, but I, I, I'm going to wait till I finish Red Dirt before I uh, interview again, and I hope you will have time to do this, Scott. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's a lot of fun. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.